Well, we just had so much fun the first time that we did this that we have to do another one. We're doing the 2020 draft. We're redrafting it here on the call up. I'm RM Layton. He's Jack McMullen. And Jack, we put even more prep into this one because this one's way harder, right? We, we redrafted 2019 before, which gives us an extra year to be able to sort out the careers of these guys. Whereas this 2020 class, you got some big leaguers, you got some guys that are close to the big leagues, and then you got some guys that are still in the lower levels of the minor leagues because they were extremely young when they were drafted. And we got to decide where we're going to take each of these guys against each other. I am ready to have a headache, but this is going to be a lot of fun. Do you know why I hate you and love you at the same time? Well, there's a lot of reasons for the hate, but let's hear I've never even thought about being trash talked about something as simple and meaningless as an MLB redraft. But here you are saying your picks are going to suck. LOL via text. You're I've been such shit a talking. dork. I've been shit talking to you since last night. Um, it's unbelievable. I'm like getting texts out of nowhere. Like your draft is going to suck, bro. <laughs> LMAO. I'm like, this is so stupid, but I'm really excited to do it because it's fun. Oh, no, I, I am excited. And it's funny because, look, we, we have an idea of of each other's perspective on most of these guys. We collaborate on most of these top prospect lists. We're always going back and forth. I'm pinging you during the season. How did this guy look, as you call him, in AAA, as you call a game, a starter or not bat or whatever? And, you know, you're always messaging me, oh, do you have more on this guy? And that's why we always have a good idea of of where each other stands. So the fun part of this, though, is we go into it blind and – while I do have a decent idea of who I think you're higher on than maybe me or just higher on in this whole draft class, I don't know what you're going to do. You don't know what I'm going to do. We have a vague idea. We also put eight names aside that we think the other is going to take ahead of us because we're going interchanging one pick each. I'm going with pick number one, then you're going to two. And I'm curious to see what eight names you feel like I'm going to take before you even have a chance to take and, and vice versa. So it should be pretty fun. We're going to break this into two episodes because we've just been going long with the off season content. So if it's on YouTube, you'll be watching it in one episode. If it's on, if you're listening on the podcast form, it's going to be two, but by the time you're listening to the, to the first episode, the second one's probably out. We're going to put it out probably several hours behind it, uh, but just makes more sense on the audio side to split it up into two. Yeah. So, We'll go with the 15 picks here. I'm number one this time since you were the first pick last time. And a reminder, if you're just stumbling upon us with this, go check out our 2019 redraft where we had a lot of fun with that. So number one pick here. And, and also one last thing I want to highlight, Jack, before we start. This is a draft of of really just a lot of unknown, right? I think Ryan Miller mentioned this, one of our guys at Just Baseball. He said the, the draft of the unknown, which because of COVID, shortened college season, a lot of high schools didn't play. You know, we didn't have the summer circuit the way we usually have it. Like there was a lot of things that were impeded, right? So there was a lot of opportunity to have some crazy steals in this draft and some crazy flubs. So that's what makes it really fun too, is that this was a draft of unknown and redrafting it is going to be as different as any of the redrafts you normally see, which are generally much different anyways. Yes, 100%. I mean, this was entirely unknown. And I think that this was the biggest crapshoot that we've seen across any professional sport in history, right? Um you know, football, the college football season was not altered whatsoever by COVID. The college basketball season, the only thing you were missing from that oh, ahead of the NBA draft was the NCAA tournament. And which yes, might have been a favor, some, which may have been a favor with the way favor. that they overrate some of the guys on their mat, a couple games in March Madness. Yeah, like it actually probably goes more chalk with no NCAA tournament than otherwise. Like I, you know, you and I both went to Syracuse. We got there fall of 2016, spring of 2016. We watched Malachi Richardson go from probably coming back as a sophomore to first round pick. And now Malachi is out of the NBA. So, yeah, like that might have actually done them a favor with baseball. These guys played like 12 games. Starters might have started like three games. I think Jack Leiter started four games at Vandy his sophomore year in 2020. So, I mean. There was so much unknown with these guys, and you had to base it off of, you know, their previous year's work. Um, really, the only full sample that, you know, you got about these college guys was the Cape season in 2019. Yeah. And you're about a year removed from yeah. that when you're picking. So extremely tough, which is why the first pick for me, and remember, this was formerly Spencer Torkelson. 
Um, he's not going to be the first pick here, and it's not a bash on Torkelson. I still believe in him. I still think he's going to be great, but not 1-1 one, one here. The number one pick is a guy that was picked way later. I believe it was 126th overall in the fourth round. It's Spencer Strider right-handed pitcher with the Atlanta Braves. And look, this guy already got a pre-arb deal basically before he even finished his rookie season. Um, he's already looking like one of the top 20 arms in the game. And, and I think that's even a little bit conservative. He has dealt with a little bit of an injury at the end of the year a lot, but not too worried about that. I'd say the only question we really have about Strider is, can he ramp up to 175, 180 innings? Because we've never really seen him do that at any level. That's not really that big of a question, especially in today's game. If he's going 150, 160 innings and, and they even keep him a bit shorter, he's still one of the most dominant arms in the game. We saw him strike out 16. Uh, you know, we saw him strike out double digits in so many different occasions. The fastball is electric. The, the slider is disgusting. This guy is is a top 20 pitcher. And if I can get a guaranteed top 20 pitcher who's already shown it at the big league level, that's got to be the pick one one. Yes. Um, you asked me, do you know who the number one overall pick is? And I was like, yeah, I do. Um, he is the only established big leaguer on this list. The only one. 2019, there are several others. Yeah. I would say Reed Detmers encroaches Detmers, on, on, you know, you on, could also, on the precipice of established big leaguer after yeah. what he did last year. You know, you could also, I guess, say Crochet because he kind of has like a year and a half there, but he's a bullpen guy now. Yeah. So I, I'd say Strider and Detmers, but Strider was obviously Spencer freaking Strider. He was top 10 in Cy Young voting. He was second in Rookie of the Year voting. So, yeah, I mean, Strider was the clear-cut 1-1. One, one. Number two, I'm going with the number five prospect in baseball, according to you at JustBaseball.com, and that's Jordan Walker. Yeah. Um, I have to go with Walker, right? Like, this guy has prodigious power out the ass. The original pick was Heston Kerstad to Baltimore and Kerstad could absolutely still be a first round pick in this because mm -hmm. when he did come back from complications from myocarditis, he was really good at the lower levels. We just have yet to see him at the higher levels. Yeah. Walker originally went 21st. All this guy has done is look like a college bat when he was taken out of high school. Yeah. Like he looked like he was a three-year guy at Duke taken yeah. in the first round as soon as he jumped into pro ball in 2021. This guy has 40, 45, hell, 50 homer potential at the very top of like the outcomes. He can, I kind of play third. He's working on the corner outfield spots. He will find a spot because the bat is best power bat in baseball caliber. And and the athleticism too, right? Like you talked about working on third. I don't, <clears throat> I don't know if he'll ever be, you know, elite defender there. And I know he can't play there because he is getting there so quickly that Nolan Arenado is still going to be anchoring the hot corner there. But in a world where there is no Nolan Arenado, I think Jordan Walker is more than good enough at third base. Like he's an athlete. He's got a ridiculous arm. He's working on his reads and routes in the outfield, but he, he can run, man. You look at the stolen bases, being able to go see him in the Arizona fall league. I was floored at how athletic he is. You can yeah. see how, how athletic he is as a hitter, but seeing how well he runs was, was really remarkable as well. I think he's going to grow into a really good outfielder. He's got a plus plus arm uh, in that right field spot. He could be really good out there as he gets more comfortable. And then of course can always play first, no brainer pick a number two. And that was a guy I had at number two on my big board too, because I mean, what, what he is potentially going to become while already showing us at the double a level that he can rake. So it hedges some of the concern. And that's the big question that you and I are, are really having to juggle in this whole thing, right? Is upside versus risk. And that's the what you do in every draft. But in a redraft, it's even more pronounced because you have a more more of a sample size here. And it's like, how much do you want to roll the dice? Because you have some guys that, okay, Garrett Crochet, like you said, proven reliever, but I'd rather probably roll the dice on a guy that looks like a starter in high A. Uh, yeah. But at what point does that scale tip? And that's what makes this really, really fun. And even at pick three for me, um, I'm, I'm already struggling with that. Yeah. Where are you going? So there's a few names that yeah. I could go between here and oh, I have my big board in front of me and, and I knew yeah. I was going to overthink this one. The second I got to this pick. Yeah. There was a uh, clear cut one, two, and it gets really cloudy. A clear three. cut One, two, and then it gets really, really stressful. I'm, I'm going to go with Pete Crow Armstrong at number three. Oh, my God. <laughs> what? Really? I think I'm going to do it. <laughs> okay. 
What should I should I'm I write, change? I'm it? writing it down. I'm writing it down. No, no. Hold on, okay. hold on. <sighs> Max Meyer was the original pick. Miami Correct. at three. Correct. I'm I'm seriously considering it. I'm 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 up. Give me about ten more seconds here. Yeah, I'm gonna stick with it. Pete Crow Armstrong at number three. Got this it. guy absolutely could be one of the best center fielders in baseball. He's a friend of the podcast, so I'm biased. Um, No, but realistically, he's already a gold glove caliber center fielder. He is already mashing. Um, There's legitimate above average power here. He can run. The field of hit continues to get better. I'm going to take the shoe in center fielder that I think continues to get better offensively. He's extremely young and lost a year and already made up for, for the lost time. Yeah. Could I have gone Kyle Harrison here? Absolutely. But I'm going to go with the everyday center fielder, which in the prospect realm, generally speaking, if it's an everyday outfielder, everyday center fielder versus a pitcher, usually those, those everyday guys are going to be prioritized and I'm going to prioritize the, uh, the center fielder. Dude, I'm you're crazy, man. Like, I get it. I totally get it because he's got such a high floor. Um, he was coming in around like an 820 OPS this year, cross high A and a little bit of double, right? Tail end of the year was he was he in double? Uh, yeah. Or yeah. Okay. no, <laughs> no, no, he was. He didn't spend the entire year in high A, did he? Right. No, he spent 38 games in low, and then he spent 63 in high A. So 101 games, he checked in at an 896 OPS. So th- there's some impact here, and he had 10 triples. Like that's really, really exciting stuff. Oh, so, look who's coming around now. I, I uh, could, I could see 16 it, homers, 32 stolen bases, elite defense in center field. He's also got the makeup left-handed bat. I, I, I don't, I don't really know how how you can pass. I'm 20 years old. Right. I mean, I just think when you're looking at at what this guy's floor is, it's already gold glove center fielder. And then what he's capable of offensively, I think it's really hard to pass on. Damn, man. Yeah. Shit. I get it. I get it. It's just crazy because like Torkelson's going to keep on falling, I think. And I don't want him to keep on falling. Like I'm really considering Torque here at four. Just because you know how good the bat is. Like, it feels like 2022 is a fluke. But if he comes out and at the All-Star break, he's hitting like 210 again, I'm I'm out. That That's the big problem with Torkelson. So I, I like the idea of Pete Crow Armstrong, who is dynamic, who is multifaceted, as, you know, he, he's almost like the antithesis of Torkelson here because Torque is such an advanced bat, but he doesn't provide much else. PCA, advanced bat at the lower levels, provides literally everything else um i'm wrestling with torkelson but i'm not going to do it kyle harrison at four for me the original pick um was asa lacy who i guarantee you will not be going in this in this redraft (laughs) zero Um, percent chance (laughs) like literally zero percent chance that that he goes in here kyle harrison was originally the 85th overall pick third round uh 85th overall to san francisco And, and kyle harrison another guy that has come into professional baseball and looked like a college arm that was actually a high school arm. And the reason I think I balk less at Harrison than I do PCA is because Kyle Harrison, while PCA spent the majority of this past season at high A and then previously at low A, Kyle Harrison did the high A to double A jump. And we know how big that jump is, high A to double. And double is like the proving ground for pitchers, right? Andy Painter became legitimate, became one of the best pitching prospects in baseball when he dominated double. Yep. Kyle Harrison dominated high A. He got up and was great in double A. So that's why I go with Kyle Harrison. I think this guy, I know Pipeline just put him out as the top left-handed pitcher, pitching prospect in the game, right ahead of Ricky Tiedemann. It's 1A, 1B with him and Tiedemann. Um, I side with Harrison, and that's why I go with him at four. Yeah, you know, that's who I was between. It was between him and, and PCA. Um I, I think with with Harrison, there's a little bit of of you know h- how much is he going to be able to command everything to to reach that ceiling if he's more of that that three type? Would I rather have an everyday center fielder or would I rather have a number three starter? And, and that's kind of the question here. Uh, but obviously Harrison has the stuff to become you know a frontline guy. I think he very well can become a frontline guy, and we saw him 
really solidify, I think, the floor and, and give us a little bit more optimism that he can become that frontline guy with what he did in double A, as you said. Uh, but ultimately, that was the really tough juggle for me was, do I want the everyday center fielder who could turn into, you know, some some version of Michael Harris or that top left-handed pitching prospect in the game uh, in Kyle Harrison? And, and for what it's worth on, on our top 100 list, I do have Kyle Harrison ranked ahead of him. Uh, but we'll we'll see, you know, in the update, I still think Harrison will be ahead of him. So that that is worth noting there. Number five. This is another one of those interesting spots here because I, I know you're going to take Torkelson before me, by the way, and, and I'm not taking Torkelson here. Um, the previous pick at number five was Austin Martin, who yeah. may or may not be selected in this thing. I think we'll have he'll to, be on the fringe. Yeah, he'll be on the fringe. And this is one where, again, we're kind of weighing ceiling versus floor. You know, what What can I guarantee myself? What can I hope for? And ultimately, I got to go Reed Detmers here. Um, you know, Reed Detmers showed us at the big league level what he could do. And, and this guy, this is another one of those like pitting him against himself situations. Reed Detmers basically skipped through the minor leagues, right? Barely through. Uh, what was it? 60 innings in the minors before debuting in 2021 struggled in 2021 comes back in 2022 and, and looked really solid, man, a three, seven, seven ERA and 129 innings. Uh, th that slider is disgusting. The fastball shape is good. Continues to get better and better with that fastball. I think it's the commands getting better. The shapes getting better. I, I think this guy's going to be a really solid middle of the rotation lefty for a long time. He's still 23 years old too. And he'll be 23 years old when the season starts, Jack. I mean, if he was a prospect like Kyle Harrison, probably putting up crazy numbers in double and triple A, maybe he he's getting hyped up a little bit more. I think it's easy to forget how good Reed Detmers is because he's got a year of service time basically under his belt now. This guy can really pitch, and he's a guaranteed rotation piece for you from day one. Yeah, a hundred percent. I'm, you know, I'm a huge fan. Like you probably just took a guy that you wrote down for me that I was going to overdraft. I assume I'm one for one on you, by the way, with PCA. So here we go. <laughs> but um. Yeah, I mean, Detmer's like, you know how big of a fan I am of him. I just think, you know, Reed is like, floor is a five. Ceiling is a three. And a damn good three. For Kyle Harrison, floor is a four. Ceiling is a two or maybe a one, if everything goes according to plan, right? So that's the thing with the floor situation here, is how true is that floor if he hasn't done it at the big league level yet? Like how right. positive are you that Kyle Harrison is a big league four? I think right, the like, odds are very much in his favor, given that, you know, he struck out nearly 14 per nine in double a, uh, but at the same time, he walked more than four batters per nine. You know, he had a three eleven ERA. He did give up some home runs. Um, I, I think it's very likely that he is a four at worst case scenario with that, with that higher upside, of a Reed Detmers, but at the end of the day, you got to call a spade a spade and his floor is technically not even in a rotation. Um, if, if we haven't seen him do it at the big league level, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I, no, that, that, I, even though I, I am willing to say his near floor is, is back end of the rotation guy because of how good his fastball and, and how good, you know, Kyle Harrison stuff is. Yeah. A hundred percent. And like, that's the thing, man. So we, we say, Oh, it's foolproof that his floor is a four. Well, I thought it was foolproof that Spencer Torkelson's floor was a 700 OPS and he was yep. 100 points below that at the big Correct. league level. So Correct. that's Torkelson's floor. Um, and that's why I'm taking Torkelson at five uh, or six. Sorry. Um, I have to do it, man. Like, yes, a 600 OPS and 110 big league games, but 129 games at Arizona State, the guy had a 1200 OPS. 156 games in minor league baseball across a year and a quarter. This guy, 156 games. So we'll call it a full season sample. 889 OPS, 35 doubles, 35 pumps, 109 driven in. It's just so hard to argue with those numbers. And I understand that, hey, he he got his first chance at major league baseball and failed miserably. But He's just, he was so good a hitter in college. He was so good a hitter in the college summer leagues that he was in team USA collegiate national team. He was such a good hitter in minor league baseball. It's hard for me to imagine a world where Spencer Torkelson comes back and is a 650 OPS guy. No, I I'm with you. 
I, I I'm with you on that. I, I don't, I really struggled with where I was going to take him just because of the, the positional aspect of it. Right. If, if I'm really weighing the positional side with the PCA pick, I got to stick to that with, with, with some of the other selections. I believe in Torkelson to bat though. You know, I really do. Um, and this was a Detroit Tigers organizational wide struggle that we have highlighted. Right. And, and I think it's going to change with, with Harris at the helm and, and a whole new hitting philosophy from top to bottom. Riley green was as foolproof as it gets as well. Right. I mean, this is another guy that, yeah, a little bit more swing and miss in his game, but I mean, I was willing to put a lot of money on Riley green putting together a 700 OPS in his rookie season. He didn't either. Uh, a little bit of that is their home ballpark, which by the way, they are thank goodness moving in the walls. And I was thinking about how many more home runs Miggy would have had there, but uh, you look at the data on Torkelson, he makes good swing decisions. His contact rates are solid. We know the exit velocities are great. Yeah. He's one of those that's really hard to pinpoint why he struggled, and I think that's exactly why I think he's going to be just fine. I think it was a little bit of pressing. I think it was a little bit of circumstance. I think it was a little bit of just being in a bad situation, and he seems like he's one tweak away from being uh, the guy that we always thought he could be. So I have no problem with that pick there. It was definitely before I would take him, but yeah. – I already had him as one of the guys that you were going to take. Uh, there we go. Him. So um, perfect. I, I um, like, I like, it, I think he's going to bounce back in a big way this year. Yeah. Original pick was Emerson Hancock at six and Hancock. I do think we'll go here. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> That's another name that I have for you. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, so now we have pick number seven, seven, which yeah. was originally Nikki G originally Nikki G which man, um, I'm writing up the Pirates farm system right now that we're going to go over that at some point this week, probably end of the week. Uh, and he's in their top 10, Nikki G, but obviously not in the top 10 picks of this redraft here. And this is where I am going to go with a roll of the dice. I'm going and not it roll of the dice is probably a little much, but I'm going upside here. Bobby Miller. I have a chance to get one of the most electric arms, not only in the minor leagues, but in professional baseball period, right? We're talking about a guy who averaged 99.3 miles per hour on his fastball, which would have led major league baseball. It's a guy that threw well over a hundred pitches that were, that were over a hundred miles an hour last year, ran it up to well over one oh one. Like this guy, this guy can really, really throw the ball hard, but also has really good stuff. This entire arsenal is really good. Guy that likes to play with the fastball at the top of the zone usually doesn't bode well in the PCL. I think he's going to get more comfortable with that. Uh, but between double A AA and triple A, that's that's never you know the best recipe uh, when you're a high fastball guy. I think it's going to translate much better at the big league level. But this guy, we just talked about him a lot in the Dodgers episode. We just put out freak athlete, really really electric arm, and and you know I mean, he's got front line upside. We talked about it on the Dodgers episode. So if we think this guy can be an ace, I can't pass on him at six or at seven. Yeah, no, I, I get it, man. Um, he's, he's a star and I'm thinking about Gavin stone at eight. I'm not going to do Gavin stone at eight. I'm going to go with somebody that, uh, I actually had written down for you as a guy that, as a guy that you were going to take, cause I was thinking he would already be off the board by now. Um, I'm going with Evan Carter at, at eight. Damn. Evan, yeah. Right. <laughs> like it. Evan Carter, the original pick was Robert Hassel. And I think Hassel nine was Veen. So Hassel and Veen, I'm sure you have Veen written down for me because you know how big of a Zach Veen guy I am. But mm -hmm. I mean, those two were underwhelming this year when Carter just ticked up and Evan Carter does literally everything well. Would you like a little bit more power from him? Yes, but he was a high school draft pick in 2020. So he's got room to fill out. He's got room to turn 12 homers into 20 homers. But what you love is he's a 25 double guy. He's a 10 triple guy. He was a 28 stolen bases guy. And he was a K rate under 20%, right? Or right around 20%. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, the, he was, I think, below 20% on the year, if I'm not mistaken, 17% on, on the season. So he's almost, it, the way I view him is in a very similar light to that of Pete Carr Armstrong. A, and I think that I'm more willing to put money on a Carter and PCA as opposed to a Veen and Hassel. Veen, I think, is a higher ceiling than everybody that we're talking about here. Oh, absolutely. But absolutely. a much lower floor. So a few you know, contextual things that to, to hit on all of what you said, because they're all valid points. And just to kind of accentuate all of those points, six, four, one ninety. I think he's got some room in that frame to add some pop. Yes, absolutely. For <clears throat> the, the, the bat to ball skills, 85% zone contact. That's really good for a, a high school guy that 
climbed multiple levels and, and reached, you know, with double A last year, 102.4 mile per hour, 90th percentile exit velo, very solid. That's above average. And we just talked about how much more impact he can add here. And, and he already doesn't chase 18% chase rate, walked at a 14% clip, much safer than PCA offensively, but PCA balances that out with the floor of being, you know, a multiple win player. Like his floor, PCA's floor is Kevin Kiermeyer. Evan Carter's floor, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's something really solid because his bat to ball skills are good. He already hits the ball hard enough. And, and you mentioned all the other things. I love that pick. I'm pretty pissed I didn't get a chance to, to get Evan Carter. Cool. So you steal him from me. And that was pick number eight. So that goes to to number nine for me now, where there's a few different directions I could go on this one. I definitely considering Gavin Stone, but if I'm going to revert back to my big board, which had me taking PCA, and now I'm going to go probably a little bit earlier and probably a guy that you had down for me as well. I'm going to go Brandon Fott. And Brandon Fott. I didn't have him down. No. Ooh, okay. Brandon Fott was previously selected 149th overall. That's in the fifth round. Uh, yeah. And this was a pick where, look, it was previously Veen. I think you could make the case that that Veen is, is a fine pick here still too. But I think Brandon Fott is a dark horse for, for rookie of the year. This coming, if they bring him up soon enough. The, the way he's able to get hitters out, and this was a guy that I, I enjoy just kind of going back and looking at the video because <clears throat> ahead of this redraft, I I wanted to really make sure I was solidified in my Brandon Fott, you know, take here of, of how early I want to I want to select him. But fastball average is 94 miles an hour and, and in zone with a 26 percent is ridiculous. It can run up to, you know, 19, 20 inches of induced vertical break. So a ton of ride there. Slider, ridiculous, 38 percent chase rate. 27% in zone whiff, change up 42% chase rate, 25% in zone whiff. And then he mixes in a taste breaking curveball. So we're talking about a guy that has a ridiculous arsenal. He had a 5% walk rate last year. ERA inflated because he pounds the strike zone and was pitching in the PCL. I think that's a guy, again, also that's going to go to the big leagues and be even better. 6'4, 225 pounds, such a high floor. And I think he can turn into a, a number two, number three type of guy. Uh, but worst case scenario, this guy is going to be a back end of the rotation starter that just eats innings. But I think he's going to be a lot better than that. And I love his mechanics. I love Fott, man. I, I'm a huge fan. I'm kind of pissed that you took him because I was eyeing him in like the 15 range. Like I was oh, thinking yeah, he, no shot he, was, he was falling to you there. Yeah, I get it, man. Uh, no, Fott is great. Shout out the Bellarmine Knights, which was D2 when Fott was there. They made the jump to D1. Sucks that they won the A-Sun and couldn't get into the NCAA men's basketball tournament a year yep. ago. Stupid team rule. that never dribbles, right? So such a stupid rule. Um, yeah, like Fott is excellent. And I like that you're floating him for a rookie of the year candidacy because I think when they do make the decision to abandon the Madison Bumgarner experiment, Brandon Fott is going to get those starts and they have enough young starters, right? Dre Jamison, Ryan Nelson, Walston. I will tell you that Fott is the best of the bunch. Oh, yeah. And Fott's got the chance. A gallon and Fott one, two with Merrill Kelly as that high floor three could be great and could be exactly what Arizona needs as they get into, you know, their, their exciting and winning window. Absolutely. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, we, we have a, just the pitch grades, 55 on the fastball, 60 on the slider, 55 on the changeup, and then, you know, a 45 on the curveball with, with 60 command, which yeah. <laughs> you put all that together, you got a really solid number two type if it all translates at the big league level. Yeah, 100%. Uh, 10, the original pick was Reed Detmers. Detmers already went. He went fifth to you. I will go with Gavin Stone here. And yep. Stone was originally a fifth round pick. Stone was 159th overall, like at the end of the fifth round, like near Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant thing. <laughs> By the way, we can stop calling Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But Gavin Stone this year, 25 starts, a 148 ERA in 121 and two thirds innings in like situations where it's not fun to throw. Six games in Great Lakes, he was just so stupidly good. A 1-4-4 four, four ERA. That's four earned runs in 25 innings. All right, get the bump to Tulsa. Really hard to pitch there. Don't tell Gavin Stone that. 13 starts, one appearance out of the pen, a 1-6 ERA. Okay, go to Oklahoma City. Not only are you at altitude, but you are at the highest level of minor league baseball. 
23 and a third innings, three earned runs. I mean, you can't get better than this guy. 12 and a half strikeouts per nine, three walks per nine. And again, a 148 ERA and under seven hits per nine. Homers, we talked about this with Stone when we did the Dodgers top 10. He faced 496 batters. He allowed three home runs. Three, three. I thought it was two. Okay, three. Yeah, that's three insane. Three home runs. It's insane. So, yeah, I'm going to go with Stone because this guy should get his first big league taste in a, in a really good rotation in a team that wants to win the World Series. I, I agree, man. And the thing with Stone is what he was able to do already, you know, what we already saw from him in terms of, like, Bobby Miller, I'm still – kind of hoping for that upside right like he's done good things and i think he's, he's showed us that he can get outs right but stone's already showed us that at worst he's going to be able to to get outs in the back of the rotation of, of a big league team you know and and I, I think there's more upside there uh and i think he could be a really solid starter but i think we've already seen enough to where when we talked about that dodger system who's getting called up first we would both bet gavin stone and i think that kind of says a little bit about how polished he is so to get him there uh, is is absolutely great. I, I, that was if he was falling to me, I would have taken him with the next pick. So uh, to gotcha. add some context to that. All right, so that sends us to pick number eleven, 11. yeah, which was previously Garrett Crochet. Not going to be Garrett Crochet though. You know, you you can't fault the pick. You know, you're not staying with the pick, but you, you're able to plug a guy straight into. No, I'm not sticking with the pick. You're able to plug that guy straight into your bullpen, and he was pretty good before. You know, going down with Tommy John. This is a this is a good player that you know we'll see if somebody takes him before the end of this first round. But this is where you have a lot of players for me that are kind of in the same vicinity, and I think I might surprise you with this one because I'm just going to take to me the best athlete on the board and a guy that is has already shown it at the double A level as a youngster for all the same reasons that. Now, we love Jordan Walker, not quite with the ceiling, yeah. but Mason win. Um, yeah. I'm going to take the tooled out freak. <laughs> I mean, this is a dude that can throw a triple digits from shortstop. He's a plus plus runner and really swung it last year, which is something that I don't think anybody was expecting. And, and I got to see him on the backfields ahead of the season, saw the adjustments he made with his swing and going into the year, I was like, oh my gosh, this guy's going to break out. And if you look at the early episodes of the call up, that was something I came back. I literally drove straight home from the backfields recorded an episode immediately and said, Mason Wynn's going to go crazy. And sure enough, he he went pretty crazy. The question was always going to be how much power is he going to hit for? And I think that's still a valid question, but the dude yeah. launched 12 home runs between high A and double A and saw the power tick up in double A as well. Strikeout rate right around 20% walked at a 10% clip, uh, maybe slightly above that. I mean, this was a really good year for him. And with the speed combination, 43 stolen bases, you know, potential for 15 to 20 home run power and just the freak athleticism that could turn him into a, an elite shortstop. This guy is really special, man. And, and, and at 20 years old, I, I'm really excited to see what he's going to do this coming season between maybe even starting in triple A and could force his way to the big league conversation as well. You you said it best, just a tooled out freak. And, and that's what I think he is, man. Like, I win is, I mean, we saw him go a hundred miles an hour across the diamond of the futures game. Like yeah, the fact that he hit for as high an average as he did should curb everything you think, right? Because if he was getting blown up at double a, that's, that's one thing. I know he got a brief cameo in 2021 at high a, and he looked overmatched at points in high a in double. If he looked overmatched, he wouldn't have gone this high, but the fact that he was able to maintain and be good at the double A level says everything you got to know about Mason Wynn. He he will be ready to meet the moment. And with those tools, if you have the ability to meet the moment, you're absolutely worth it. I totally agree. Only thing missing for him is, is breaking ball recognition sliders gave him a little bit of trouble, trouble, but 85% zone contact. Uh, the, the floor is higher than I think people thought it was going to be with him. And we know what he can turn into ceiling wise. I'm going to do it. I'm going to stay with the pick. The original yes, pick is overall. We love, was, we love staying with the pick. Yeah, the original, the original pick was Austin Hendrick at 12 <laughs> with Cincinnati. So I'm going with Austin Hendrick. Let's go. Um, the original pick was Austin Hendrick at 12. I'm not picking Austin Hendrick. You're not picking Austin Hendrick. You don't know that. But, <laughs> but I am going to do it. I'm going to do what you're expecting me to right yes. here. 
That's what I was. Yep. Yeah, that's what I thought you were talking about when you said do it. Um, yeah, I'm gonna do it. 55 for 64 in the stolen base department this year between high A and double A. You, you can't make that up. Yes, he struggled with some swing and miss, but he had an OPS right around 900 in the fall league. Struck out eight times. He walked 15 times in 99 plate appearances. Zach Veen has the ability to be a superstar and a top 10 player in baseball. He did struggle a lot. He struck out a lot. He had an OPS right around 720 this year. And Hartford was too high a level for him, I think. But if this guy gets comfortable at the double A level, he could be a rocket ship. Um, you know how high I am on him. And uh, I, I got to put my money where my mouth is at 12. Yeah. I mean, look, this is, this is a, a good spot to be able to get somebody that could potentially hit 40 home runs, you know, especially with, with the Colorado Rockies shows. Got to remember to, I keep forgetting. I always forget to mention what team the prospect is with Zach yeah. Bean, Colorado Rockies six, four with the speed that you mentioned still has some more room to add physicality. And by the way, he just turned 21, right? Like this guy's really young. It, it was, it was a big test in Hartford, as you mentioned. And, and I think it was an opportunity for him to, to kind of see what what's missing and, and see where he needs to improve. The, the whiff is is definitely there. I don't think it was egregious given, you know, what what he – you would think he struggled like last year. Like I almost feel like you go back and it was like, oh, it wasn't as bad as I thought. But it definitely wasn't good for a guy that was everyone's favorite, you know, this guy could go nuclear prospect and, and just didn't quite go nuclear. Um, but in terms of the whiff, it wasn't as bad. You see 177, 262, 234, and you're like, oh, no, like this guy's doomed. But I, I think it was really just him being overmatched a little bit and and really just learning what it takes to to hit against more advanced pitching as a 20 year old. So I, I think he's going to be much better this second time around at the double a level, especially because the whiffs weren't too egregious. So uh, th this guy's going to be really good. I still believe it. Uh, just obviously the risk is what sends him down a little bit in this redraft. Yeah. So that sends us to pick number 13, which was previously Patrick Bailey. San Francisco Giants switch hitting catcher who just has not quite been able to put it together, you know, I, and, and Bailey's probably not a guy that's going to get taken here. Um, just really struggled offensively. Doesn't excel enough defensively uh, to, to really merit consideration here. So I'm between a couple guys. Um, you've got Robert Hassel, the third, right. Who I think is right there with Veen. Uh, in terms of young, exciting outfield prospect who can play in center and doesn't quite have as much of the the insane upside, but still has a lot of upside. And then somebody that I just continue to get more excited about in Tyler Soderstrom, who I think the power and the bat is close to that of a Tristan Casas if you really do the dive. And that's been wow. a fun dive that I've been doing lately. And I really think he, he he is not that far off from encroaching on that territory, but the approach needs to to be ironed out a little bit i'm gonna go with robert hassel though because you know I, I don't want to similar to the zach veen situation i don't want to put too much stock into a young high school hitter struggling in double a right after a trade right so like that that's the thing with hassles like i don't want to put too much stock into oh yeah in 27 games this guy hit 222 311, 296 after he was part of one of the biggest trades in major league baseball history and has to adjust to, you know, a, a much more challenging level. You've seen a lot of hassle back from your days in Fort Wayne. Uh, you talk about how underrated his athleticism is. That's something that, you know, was really eye opening to me when you, when you tip me off on that, doing the dive on the video, seeing how well this guy moves those 50 slash 55 run grades are closer to 55 slash 60. You know, we started to see him more effective on, on the base paths. We've had him on the podcast. We know what kind of guy he is makeup wise. He really knows the game. And I think that's going to help him continue to, to head towards that 55 hit tool that we put on him close to 60 hit tool. And there's room for, for above average power. So, you know, I, I really think this guy's going to bounce back in a big way. And, and I almost feel more confident that it, his hit tool is going to translate, you know, and bounce back a little bit easier than Veen. Obviously Veen's power is, is nuclear uh, ability, but you know, I think Hassel is one of my favorite bounce back guys for this year. And if he bounces back, he's right back into the conversation as one of the better young outfield prospects in the game. 
Yeah, I you know how big of a fan I am of Hassel. And one of the things that we were talking about was his ability to manipulate his swing. And we talked with him about that, right? Like his ability to backspin a ball and just let it roll. And I mean, there were a couple of pitches that he had no business getting bad on ball with. And and he almost like parallel to the ground, he just took the bat like about shin high and golfs it out. Like his ability to spin a ball and meet a ball wherever is really impressive. And you speak to that hit tool. I have a feeling this guy's not going to strike out much when he is in his final form at the major league level, yeah. because he's always going to be that. I want to hit 300, that kind of guy. And yeah. I don't want to strike out. I feel bad when I strike out. He's always going to be that kind of guy. Swing malleability. Like he yeah. is the epitome of it where he can yeah adjust that barrel and, and be able to get to ridiculously tough pitches. Like you said, that always translates his lower half has been inconsistent. He acknowledged that on the podcast. I asked him about that. And he's been a guy that, that tends to drift a little bit. So many young hitters do. That was what I was, what I saw in Mason win when, when I saw him on the backfield, getting in that backside and staying there with his twitchiness. I was like, Oh my gosh, if Hassel comes out in spring training, in that backside and staying there better with more control of his lower half with his twitchiness and his ability to, to control the barrel. I'm going to be all in. So that's a guy that definitely, you know, is, is one tweak away from sending him his way, probably back into the top 10 consideration of this redraft. If we do it, which I'm sure we'll do it again at some point during the year. Cause it's, it's so uh, you know, it, it's, it really could change as, as we continue to go. It's so fluid. This is a content machine, man. We just got to keep on doing it. Next episode, we're gonna we're gonna assess our 2020 MLB redraft redraft. Yeah. Um, all right, 14. The original pick was Justin Foscue, which is actually a pretty good pick yeah, at not this bad point. At yeah, Foscue to Texas. Um, Foscue is a guy that has had success at the double A level. Um, he should get his, you know, feet really wet in triple A this year. And maybe depending on you know who goes down on the uh who goes down on the big league side, like maybe Foscu gets his first chance this year. If not, he's probably a 2024 guy. I also think he's a pretty good trade ship for them because they're, yeah. they're pretty filled out mm -hmm. around where he is. Um, I'm not going to go with Foscu here. I'm going to do something that you're going to think is like really weird. I think yeah, that's wouldn't be the first time. I'm going to go Cade Cavalli at 14. <laughs> that is a little weird, but honestly, that, that was one that, that I'll let you go as the, before I forget. That was one that I was sitting, staring at my computer last night. Like, where the hell do I take this dude? Yeah. It's what hard he because he's already 24 and we know he's got the DL hall frustration levels of command. It's, it's, oh my God, you're so good. If you just throw some effing strikes for the love of God, throw effing strikes and, and he doesn't you. do it. And stay healthy. But Cavalli, 123 innings in 21 in the minor leagues, a 3.36 ERA, 20 starts in AAA, a 3.71 ERA. And this is a guy that, you know, across his minor league experience is averaging 11 and a half Ks per nine. So we know how good he is, right? We know that the fastball is 100. We know that it's a bowling ball of a fastball. But I don't know, man, like his. His major league debut, he wasn't ready for his major league debut. They gave it to him anyways, and he got blown up. Four and a third, six hits, seven runs, two walks. He's really hard to peg, but I think a guy that throws this hard with that good of stuff can't drop any farther than like the here's, lottery, one through 15. the roll of the dice that we're talking about, right? Like yeah. this is where you got to roll the dice at, at this late. And it, it boils down to this, dude, because <laughs> – when, when you look at our top 100 rankings, Cavalli's at 89 because of the injury risk and 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 some of the struggles late, late in the year with his command. But you will not see a prospect, pitching prospect, outside of our top 40, maybe 30, with better pitch grades than Cade Cavalli. I have a 60 on his fastball with 70 future. I have a 60 on his curveball with 70 future. I had a 50 on his slider with 55 future and a 50 on his changeup with 55 future and a 35 on his command. So. Yeah. I mean, the, the stuff you go to the 2021 data specifically, 
in zone whiff above 30% on all of his secondaries. That's insane. insane. Swinging strike rate across his whole arsenal of 16%. Insane. 20% on all of his secondaries. And we already know how good the fastball is when it can run up to triple digits. He is disgusting. And you're not going to get a higher upside arm this late than Cade Cavalli. So I'm, I'm with you on that one. I just didn't know where the hell to take him. Yeah, I, I took him at 14, so you didn't have to think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so thank you for that. Yeah. Now at 15, I, I think I, I, I got to go with, with the guy that I was floating in. And this is this is kind of one of my statement picks as, as a clue into what you can expect in, in the 2023 update that'll be coming out in the next couple of weeks for just baseball stop 100 list. So, you know, this is a little bit of a glimpse into, you know, who's going to really climb, <clears throat> excuse me, and I think you got to look at somebody like Tyler Soderstrom because you're going to, I think a lot of people are going to be really excited about how much he is climbing, uh, especially owners of him in dynasty or A's fans or whatever it may be. This is a guy that I, I think is going to make one of the biggest leaps in our top 100 list because I really was, was impressed with the swing and how far it's come. And, and the previous pick was Mick Abel who actually gets serious consideration for stick with the pick here, uh, right-handed pitcher for the Phillies who is, is going to be really good. I mean, he has ridiculous stuff. Another guy, command needs to come along a little bit, but really, really talented pitcher with, with big frame that I think is going to keep getting better. Uh, high school guy as well. But ultimately, you know, this is where I'm going to go with, with the first baseman. And I know he's technically still listed as a catcher, maybe with some adjustments to you know the way that the catching position is, is viewed. Maybe he can be a little bit of that auxiliary guy and still catch when you need him to. Um, but you know, I think they're kind of covered there with Shea Langliers. But this is a dude that the power is off the charts. His swing is so advanced. I, it, it's going to play. Uh, his, his, his swing decisions continue to get better. But I really think this guy could be a 30 to 35 home run dude that gets on base at a pretty high clip. And um, I'm really impressed with how far he has come and, and how good he looks right now and has looked at the upper levels last year. He's so young. He He's like a brand new 21 years old, and he already has nine games in AAA under his belt. And you mentioned how good he looked at the higher levels. Lansing, he was just hitting the crap out of the ball. 20 bombs in 89 games. So he had an 837 OPS there. In Midland, in 36 games, he had a lower OPS, but he was a 280 hitter in Midland. Yep. So yep. it was just the walks. His ability. He just what? wasn't walking. He just wasn't walking. Yeah. That was it. He just wasn't walking. And like still, even though he wasn't really walking 10 walks and 147 plate appearances because of how good he hit, he was still like a 327 OBP, which is fine. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, like I think Soderstrom is really good. And I think right now, I think Casas light is a really good comp for him because Casas is a pure hitter that happens to have a lot of power. Yeah. I think that's Soderstrom too. 85% zone contact. He launched 29 home runs. He drove in over 100 runs. I think he led all of minor league baseball or or was um, maybe behind Mervis, but um, among the top in minor league baseball and runs driven in, um, crushes fastballs, 31% chase rates, the one issue, right? I think it's because he sees the ball so well and because he hits everything so well. He hits, he really crushes fastballs, crushes breaking balls. I think if he can tone down the approach a little bit in terms of just, cutting down that chase rate. If he walks at a decent clip, which I think he'll start to because people aren't going to want to pitch to him, it's going to be an OBP machine. And that's kind of the one thing that's missing between you know him being more like Casas, but 105.6 mile per hour, 90th percentile exit velo absolutely plays. And this is going to be one of the guys that I think turns into a, a consensus top 30 prospect with how he's going to come out in AAA next year and, and really mash in a good environment to mash, but also just with the way he's able to hit. Oakland with how crappy a situation they put their fan base in does have some fun stuff going on with yep. Shea Langoliers getting to be an everyday catcher and, and with Estero Ruiz getting everyday reps, we think. And with Soderstrom like knocking on the door, I love Jordan Diaz. I think Jordan Diaz can be really good. Um, I mean, they've, they've got some exciting stuff coming. Absolutely. And, and I think they're, they're, they're heading, they're heading in the right direction overall in terms of the system and the sustainable, you know, depth and talent. It just where I differ is whether they really needed to, to tear the whole thing down uh, given where they were at as, as a franchise. And uh, but you know, that's, that's an entirely different conversation that we'll have when we highlight that system overall, but 
that'll do it for the the first half here of of the draft. All right, it's pick number sixteen, Jack. You are up. Yeah. Um. So originally, pick number sixteen was Ed Howard in the Cubs system, shortstop, who just stick with it. hasn't come along as quickly or as successfully as many in the Cubs organization would hope. But he is a Chicago kid. You want to keep giving him chances. There is a chance that Ed Howard turns into a big leaguer, but it feels like the rest of the organization is kind of passing him by right now, Mm -hmm. which stinks. Um, I'm going to go with the 30th overall pick. There was no 30th overall pick in 2020. I think Houston had their pick forfeited. Um, So I'm going with 30th overall competitive balance round A, and that was Baltimore taking Jordan Westberg. I'm going to take Westberg at 16. Westberg is a guy that can play short, can also probably play a really good second base, and was around a 900 OPS this year in double and triple A. He's really close. Um, I think that Westberg is probably a better prospect than Connor Norby is. I think he does more than Norby. Norby probably has a better power tool. But I think if you are factoring in one of these young guns, you know, if, if you're a team trying to trade with the Baltimore Orioles, if the Orioles want a starting pitcher, you're probably asking about Westberg before Norby. Absolutely. And both those guys are in a similar spot. So, I'm going to go with Westberg, who was great at Mississippi State and uh, I think can kick ass in the major league level in a middle infield spot. Yeah, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I love Connor Norby. That was a guy that I loved the second he was drafted, right? And and he's even exceeded my expectations there, but he's a second baseman. Westberg, there were some questions as to what caliber of shortstop he could play, and, and I think he's answered that he could play everyday shortstop. Is he going to be a gold glover? No, but I think he's going to be very solid there. you you're, you're not going to know one way or another, which is fine given what he does offensively. He also has the arm to play third. He's also athletic enough to play second. I, I think he could even play the outfield if you gave him some time to get more acclimated out there. But he can definitely play the shortstop position every single day at at, at least an average level, which is is an answer for what was maybe one of the bigger questions with him in terms of hitting, dude. He is raked at every stop. Is he going to swing and miss a little bit? Sure. But we've actually seen the, the strikeout rate drop at each level, which is consistent with a guy that, you know, I think you look at the 24, 25% K rate between double A. That's kind of what you expect to normalize. Then he gets to triple and the strikeout rate drops because the zone's a little bit tighter and the pitchers throw more strikes. So that effective wildness allows it to drop to 22%. That tells me that that's where he's going to stay. You know, like that's where he'll always be. He whiffs enough to be in the 20% range, but he's never going to strike out more than that. And, and I expect him to to offset that with a strong walk rate, which he's walked double digit percentages for his entire career uh, in, in the minor league so far. And we saw him hit plenty of home runs last year, right? He hit 27 uh, between double A and triple A with the athleticism, 104 mile per hour, 90th percentile exit velo. He's 23 years old. I had him at number 16 on my big board and you take him at 16. So uh, I, I love the pick there. I think he's a high floor in terms of what he's already proven with still the ability to be a, an above average regular and a pretty comfortably above average regular. Yeah. Jordan Westberg was tied for fifth in minor league baseball with 69 extra base hits. Matt Mervis, who has not gone A non-draft free agent has not gone yet. He was first in all of minor league baseball a year ago. Then it was Hunter Goodman in the Rockies system. Goodman is one of those like older guys that is a fine catcher like Goodman. I'm not sure how he factors in for the long haul, but then you've got Michael Bush at 70, Josh Lester, who should get another big league chance, you know, older guy, veteran guy. I think he's 27, 28 years old, but then it was. Outman, Westberg, Ellie De La Cruz, Andy Rodriguez, Christian Encarnacion Strand. If you are mentioned in that breath as a guy that was 12 for 15 in the stolen base department as well, you got to feel good about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a guy that I, I don't think they're they're eager to trade, but also doesn't fit into their their plan. So it's, they're, they're a little bit stuck there uh, in terms of where he's going to you know, be able to play for them uh, in Baltimore. So I always love that pick when they made it and, and, Man, he is he has just been awesome climbing through the minor leagues, and the Orioles continue to to do well with their bats. That sends us to seventeen, right? Which was previously Nick York of the Boston Red Sox, and look, York looked like a steal of all steals in an underslot pick after his first year, and I I totally bought what he was selling, and then he hit a wall last year. Uh, struggled with trying to do too much. I think he was trying to pull the ball a bit too much. Also struggling with some injuries and. I thought he showed decently well after a slow start in the Arizona Fall League, finished really strong. I think he's going to bounce back. That said, he's 
with the injury issues that he's had limited to second base was drafted with some injury concerns as well. I, I just, I got to stay off of the hit first second baseman with injury issues, even though, you know, I don't think it's a bad pick even with the struggles last year whatsoever. And he could easily get himself back into the conversation of, you know, this range here, but I'm going to go with an arm that I, I I'm thrilled to be able to get at, at this stage of the draft. And it, it's Mick Abel right-handed pitching prospect with the Philadelphia Phillies. And and Mick Abel is a guy that we have him at 56 in our top 100 prospect list at the end of the year. Um, his stuff is, is ridiculous. I have, I believe on his fastball is 65 future, 55 present, a 60 slider grade. The, the changeup is already flashed above average and he mixes in a taste breaking curveball. Uh, he was previously taken 15th overall. So it's right around the same range. The command is the question. And, and that always seems to be the question with a lot of prep, right? You know, big power prep right handers that throw gas like Abel does. But, you know, I, I don't think the command has been so disastrous that I'm sounding the alarms. He's definitely walked more guys than you'd like to see, but it hasn't been to the degree of, of some of the other guys that, you know, I think would be in this range of the stuff that he has 130 strikeouts, 50 walks. I think he's going to continue to improve upon that as he gets more comfortable. He's just 21 years old, six foot five, 200 pounds. Yeah. I like Abel a lot, man. I, I, he is the Robin to Andrew Painter's Batman in the Philly system right now, but he would be Batman in a lot of other systems. Uh -huh. I promise you that. So Absolutely. yeah, I like the pick. Um, as soon as you made that, I was starting to think about where I go with this. I just have no effing clue, like no idea where I go after Mick Abel. Um, it would be a, a crazy reach for Hancock. Um, Wilmer Flores is a name that jumps to mind. It was a non-drafted free agent. Flores could be the move. I think you're missing Max an unproven. Meyer. I think you're moving missing an an unproven uh, stud right now in terms of relative to some of the other guys. In terms of right relative hand. to some of the other guys, yeah. I mean, you're thinking of Tink Hens, and I don't think I'm going to go with Tink Hens right now just because he's so far off and I haven't seen him stretched out once. You know what I mean? Like, I think that most starting pitchers can be good in a three inning spurt. And that's what Tink Hens was doing in low A. You know what I mean? Yeah. I got to see it in high A or double for me to take him over a guy that led minor league baseball in RBIs and extra base hits this year. So I'm going to steal another one of your guys that I had written down for you. It's it's time for Matt Mervis to come off the board. It was a non-drafted free agent. Mervis, yes, he's a first base DH. But he's he was Pete Alonso this year in minor league yeah. baseball. Yeah. So I got to do it. Yeah. I'm. I like it. I like it, man. I mean, look, we're talking about being able to take the the sure thing or something close to it in terms of somebody that's shown it at the AAA level, we think is big league ready. We've talked about it a ton. Um, clearly, the Cubs want to wait a little bit longer with some of the signings they've made. I think that's ridiculous, but he's hit it every single stop. And then even when he was gassed at the end of the year, raked in the Arizona Fall League, guests to the show, you can you know you listen to that episode and you can really see the makeup and the way he attacks the game and, and also just the confidence that he has, he's going to be a good hitter for a long time. I think at the big league level and, and to get, even though he's a first baseman to get him here, I think is, is, is a great pick. Original pick Bryce Jarvis by the Arizona diamondbacks. Do you know what Bryce Jarvis's ERA was in Amarillo this year? 6.9, 8.3. Oh gosh. Hit an so eight crazy because I loved, ERA. I loved him out of the draft with the fastball ticking was... up. Changeup yeah. was nasty. He matched Kumar Rocker for nine innings. Yeah, Kumar Rocker threw the no hitter, and and he was pretty much right there with nine innings, like double digit Ks, and only gave up the one run, and that was the difference. I mean, Bryce Jarvis is, I, I'm not fully swearing him off. He he's got the bloodlines, but it was it was a really weird, bad year for him last year, which was pretty pretty shocking. Yeah, I mean, it was like it was really really bad. 106 and two thirds innings. 12 hits per nine, five walks per nine, a one nine whip. I mean, dude, like this is really, really hard to look at here. So unfortunate for Bryce Jarvis, but I'm, I'm fortunate to get Mervis here. And we're really in that range, man, where it is, it is getting stressful. You need uh, to start picking your favorites. The previous pick was, was Pete Crow Armstrong at 19, who is long gone. Uh, of course that was made by the New York Mets. Um, yeah. that pick was made by if, in case you forgot um 
but he is now a Chicago Cub. There's a few different names and a few different ways I could go with this because you got some some higher floor prospect bats, guys that have seen some opportunity at the big league level, like an Alec Burleson. Um, you know, you've got a Casey Schmidt who I know you have his name down for me. Uh, you've got an Owen Casey as well, though, who I love as a prospect and monster upside, who I also know you have down for me. But then you also have a Max Meyer who, at the end of the day, man, this guy debuted. And looked pretty good. Tommy John surgery, we just talked about it on the Just Baseball show, is is an afterthought at this point. Chris Paddock gets a three-year deal as he's still recovering from Tommy John surgery. I'm going to take the guy that's pretty much proven that he's ready to go with the big leagues. Do I know what he's going to be at the big league level yet? No. But I do know that when he comes back, he's going to make a few rehab starts. And guess where the Marlins are going to plug Max Meyer? The big leagues. Because that's what he is, where he is at in his development. So, I'm going to take Max Meyer here. You know, I could have considered Tink Hens, uh, and I think Tink Hens is a higher pitcher ceiling, but Meyer's slider pretty much guarantees him that he will be at worst. If everything goes to shit for Max Meyer, he's, he's, he's a high leverage reliever with that slider. It's a 70 grade slider, but the fastball has continued to get better. The changeup has continued to improve. And I'm not really worried about Tommy John surgery. It seemed like almost an inevitability with how many sliders he throws. He gets it out of the way. Hopefully that's all he needed and he'll be healthy and might even come back throwing even harder. His fastball shape is bizarre, but there's some guys that that fastball shape are are so dead zone and weird that they actually get ground balls because it drops. He kind of turned into that a little bit. So I, I don't think the fastball is a total disaster. I like Max Meyer here at this pick, which, you know, ultimately I don't think you're going to get a, a much more high floor arm at this stage. Do you have an 80 grade pitch in the top 100? That's a great question. Um, like is Yuri's fastball an 80 fastball? It's a 70. I would say, I would say that it's pretty darn close that Max Meyer's slider could be, could be close to an 80. I think it's a 70, but it's got a chance to be an 80. Yeah. Like that, that's my thought. If there's an 80 grade pitch in, in the minor leagues or like still, you know, for a qualified prospect, it, it might be Max Meyer slider. Like that I've, might be the best pitch in minor league baseball or in the prospect world right now. G rods change up was an 80. 70, 70 with a is an 80, 70, 70 present with an 80 future. Daniel Espino, yeah. 70 fastball with an 80 future with the shape yeah. and the velo he had, but obviously we're dealing with some, some health issues there. But uh, yeah, I would say that there's a legit chance that Max Meyer's slider could be in that conversation as well. There we go. Oh, I do. have 70 present, 80 future on Max Meyer's slider. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. There we go. Um, Yeah, I I like that pick. If you didn't do him at 19, I was going to do him at 20. But I'm going with another arm that originally went 25th. The original pick was Garrett Mitchell at 20 to Milwaukee. Mitchell is a guy that will probably be the opening day center fielder for the Milwaukee Brewers. I wish he wasn't. I wish it was Sal Freelick. But Mitchell is still like a big league outfielder. We have to think about him at the back end of this first round. Mm -hmm. Um, But I am going to go with Jared Schuster, who I think is ready for a big league opportunity. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to do it. And like, this is the type of arm that I love. And you know that, like, I'd be, I'd be shocked if you didn't have him written down for me. Schuster is, what is he? 90 to 92 with the fastball for the most part. Yeah. But it, it just, it just sneaks by you. It sneaks by he works so quickly. He's just got hitters on his he- on their heels for the entirety of at bats. And, and Schuster is attack mode at all times. He doesn't walk very many guys. He runs up his innings totals. I mean, the guy was right around 140 innings in minor league baseball this year. Mm-hmm. Nobody does that. It's like Fott and Schuster that were at the top of minor league baseball and in innings accumulation. So if you took Fott nine, I couldn't let Schuster slide past 20. Look, I, I wouldn't have taken him this early, but I'm going to solidify your your case too. I, th- I think this is a really good safe pick here. Um, fastball, like you said, it, it's 90 to 92, but the data on it's pretty strong. Uh, the changeup is is a plus pitch. I mean, opponents hit 144, 178, 197 against it last year, and he threw it for a strike a ton. And then the slider is a viable third offering. I'd put a plus command grade on Schuster, so you've got, you know, Average fastball, above average to plus plus changeup, and then average to above average slider with plus command. That's a solid back end of the rotation lefty. Sign me up for that. Yeah, 100%. 
So next up would be pick number 21, which was previously Jordan Walker. What a high stick with the pick if you want. Yeah. 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 I would, if he wasn't long gone. Um, But this is where, again, I, it's a really, 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 really tough juggle, but I'm going to go with another St. Louis Cardinal here. I'm going to go with Alec Burleson. Oh my God. What? Before Hens. Before (laughs) Hens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Hens hasn't pitched above low A and that's what's Um, like, yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's what's killing me is, is hence could be, and I, I know we're going to get crushed in the comments for, for, for how far Tink Hens fell, but every single one of these guys has played above low A every single one of them. And not only did Tink Hens only play in low A and I love Tink Hens, but he was on like three inning spurts. So yeah. I, I, I look could be better than everybody. And that's why they took him. They, they knew the upside when they took him, where they took him, everybody in the draft, every team knew the upside of Tink Hens when he was taken, where he was taken, which was not in the first round. But the reality is like, We got to see him do it. So I'm going to take the guy that can play multiple positions. That is also a friend of the show. uh, That is just such a good hitter. And Burleson struggled in like 46 plate appearances at the big league level, you know, whatever. But he earned himself an opportunity up there, which is pretty remarkable for a team that was, you know, pushing to, to make moves in the postseason. We were expecting them to, and they, they didn't, uh, but he didn't strike out a ton. He, he had some good ABs in spring training. He had some good ABs at the big league level. And I still think he's going to be an above average big league bat, but this guy doesn't strike out. He hit 20 home runs last year in triple a and hit 22 the year before that climbing three levels from high a double a triple a has gotten better and better in the outfield where I think he's at least average out there has a good arm. He's a two-way guy. He's Carolina can play first base hits lefties. Well, He's just a high, another guy that I'm guaranteed it just turned 24 years old. I'm guaranteed getting a big league bat here. I think he can be an above average one with a little bit of positional versatility, above average power, above average hit tool. It's hard to pass on that. Yeah. It's, it's really hard to pass on that. God, like you do this and you leave Tink hence for me, if I go for it and like Tink hence was what he was, Oh, yeah. All right. 16 starts, 52 innings, a one three eighty RA, eight and a third innings in nine appearances. Like that's the thing. He was an inning in the Arizona Fall League and he was a two one six ERA. Do I go Tink Hens or Wilmer Flores right now? That's a fun juggle. Glad I don't have to make that decision. Gosh, OK, uh, Wilmer Flores was like a three ERA this year and he. Didn't really walk anybody. The original pick at 22, while I buy myself more time, is Cade Cavalli, who I went with at 14. Ugh. I'm out of time. Another name that should be thought about here <laughs> is Joey Weimer. Um, another, another name that should be thought about here might be Drew Romo, which didn't catch her in the Rockies organization. And I think that's where I'm going at 22. <laughs> Romo is a hit tool catcher that by what you've said in the video that i've seen is a plus defensive catcher Mm -hmm. he seems like a guy that um it's almost like he's rio muto with less power right like he's he's a really good athlete that just happens to be a catcher on the field and switch hitter that the defense the way he calls games and apparently just just the way he commands the pitching staff has has been really 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 hyped up and, and well regarded uh, my only concern with him, and it was it was a rough offensive season for him overall, but again, for catchers that are climbing levels and, and having to accommodate a lot of things, and he's a high school catcher, we know uh, what comes with that in terms of the stigma there. He just doesn't hit the ball hard. 90th percentile exit velo is pro- by far the lowest of any top 100 prospect on our list, but he's going to go somewhere where he has plenty of room in the gaps and enough, you know, to be able to you know, an area where the ball is going to carry a bit more too. And I still think he's going to add a little bit more impact and strength, but you get a switch hitting bat to ball guy that plays great defense. This is around the range where I was looking to take Drew Romo too. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that sends me to 23, 23, which was previously Carson Tucker, who I think you can safely say, well, will will likely not. Uh, be selected in this one that was Carson Tucker by the Cleveland Guardians I have a few different options here I'm gonna I'm gonna go with 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 Tank Hens now uh too much upside too much upside I'm gonna take the man Tank Hens um I mean 
just so talented, so explosive. Uh, one of the more athletic pitchers you're going to see in the minor leagues. Got to see him stretched out more. Uh, but, you know, I think they're obviously taking their time with with Tank. Stuff is just – there's so much potential there. To get a pitcher like him this late, I, I can't let him fall anymore. St. Louis Cardinals got a steal with him in the draft. They stole everybody in the 2020 draft, and Tank Hens was one of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you for doing the 10 counts thing because I was going to have to do it in 20 at 24. Oh, and for reference, he was previously selected 63rd overall in the competitive B slot. Yes. There we go. Um, all right. 24 for me. Previously, Nick Bitsko with Tampa. What do you have on Nick Bitsko? He's just been injured and, and just hasn't really been able to, we haven't really seen him unleashed much at all I mean, yeah like threw... that's a guy i just haven't heard much about at all he's got good stuff he's still only 20 he's a big dude i trust the rays with their ability to scout arms but he's just been hurt and when he's come back in short spurts hasn't looked great because he hasn't been healthy so it's kind of just a wait and see guy yeah i am going to go with wilmer flores here um wilmer flores is a guy that was a non-drafted free agent so now both notable non-drafted free agents are off the board i took mervis and i'll take flores here as well 24 starts, 103 innings, had a 2.79 ERA. Thing that really jumped out here, again, 103 innings, 130 punch outs, 23 walks. So that's 11 and a half Ks per nine and two walks per nine. So Flores was a guy that, you know, is 21 years old. He's going to turn 22 at the end of February. Um, big dude, 6'4", 225, that commands his body and commands his pitches really well. So I'll take that, especially in an organization where they need him to work out, like yeah. need him to work out. No, I mean, I, I, I like it. He he really just kind of showed what, what he's capable of. And, and the breaking ball is nasty. He He's going to be good for, for a while. And and I was able to talk to one of my buddies, Mike Rothenberg, who, who caught him a little bit and catch her in the, in the Tigers organ. And he's a big fan of, of him. He thinks he's safe, too, which, you know, you're getting a, a safe arm here this late. Sign me up for that. I think he's going to be a solid number four starter potentially for, for the Tigers, which again, for them, that probably means a number two or three uh, with the way things are going for them lately. So uh, solid, solid pickup there, probably around the range. I was looking to get him. We go to pick number that would send us to 25, which was previously yes. Jared Schuster, who you took already from the Atlanta Braves. And yep. I'm going to go with my guy, Joey Weimer. Um yeah. Weird season for Joey Weimer, where I really do believe that he got just sick of being in double A. You know, like we've seen Joey Weimer demolish double A and then all of a sudden and, and was off to a good start in double and then just went through this weird slump at the double A level. And remember, like this is a guy that probably should have been promoted before that slump. So yeah. you know, was he pressing or was he? just almost like, when are they going to call me out? I don't know what it was, but right. he he struggled a little bit through that stretch. Then he gets promoted up to triple a and just goes right back to being the guy that we always loved. And then some, I would say, because he didn't even strike out 43 yeah. games in triple a sub 20% K rate. We saw the power. He was walking. And I mean, this guy has an 80 grade arm, by the way, like one of the best arms you will see ridiculous power. Uh, we've talked about that. I mean, this guy hits the ball 115 miles an hour. He had a home run last year, 481 feet. He plays with reckless abandonment. It's, it's just crazy the way he, it's like his hair is on fire. Like we've talked about, but speed for sure. 31 stolen bases on 34 tries last year for a guy as big as he is. 21 homers. This is a true 30, 30 candidate. Maybe he doesn't swipe 30 bags at the highest level. Maybe he's closer to 20, but 100% 30, 20 guy. He could hit 40 home runs in Milwaukee if he hits enough. And, you know, I think we saw a lot of reason to believe that the hit tool isn't as concerning as we thought with what he did in 43 games in AAA. It's a pretty good sample size there. Yeah, it is a pretty good sample size. And my thing is AAA pitching is probably less nasty than it is in double A. And it's certainly less nasty than it is at the big league level. So do, like, do you think he's overmatched by nasty stuff? Do you think he might just get breaking ball and, and curveball and slidered to death? Like 
I could understand the thought, but I honestly don't think so. The only concern is, is the change-ups were, were kind of an issue for him. So I'm interested to see how, how that how that goes. But in terms of hitting VLO, demolished VLO. I think I have it in the write-up with him. 95 plus mile per hour fastballs. He had a 1339 OPS. He had 425, 49, 850. And 47 plate appearances against pitches 95 and above. Um, so he crushes Velo, which is a big prerequisite at the big league level now. Uh, he hits hard slider as well. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see how he hits good curveballs and good changeups. I think that'll be a question. But if you punish Velo and can just hold your own, like even just be a 700 OPS guy against good curveballs and good changeups, that, that should be more than enough. But I think that is probably the, the big question with him, Jack. And the only reason why he probably wasn't taken sooner being that he has above average speed and being that he projects as an above average defender in a corner who could even get by in center. If you, if you're in a pinch. Definitely. Definitely. All right. 26 was originally Tyler Stroderstrom to Oakland. Soderstrom is already off the board. You took him 15 um, at 26. I'm going to go with a guy that originally went at 14 to Texas. Foscu slid. That is because a lot of people taken after him got better. Justin Foscu is still really, really good. And this is my second guy in a part two uh, taken from Mississippi State that year in the 2020 draft. Westberg went 30th first round pick of the competitive balance round A round. Um, Foscu, again, lottery pick 14th overall, but 101 games in Frisco at the AA level this past year. Hit 290 with an 850 OPS, like 31 doubles, drove in 81, struck out 66 times in 460 plate appearances, which is an excellent, excellent clip. He didn't walk that much, but he walked enough. Foscu is a really good bat and a really good hitting prospect. Does he have a defensive home? I don't know. Yeah, you know, I would. it would help a lot if he could play third, and, right. and I don't know. You know, I haven't seen them try him there. The, the Pirates were trying Nick Gonzalez there, so anybody can be tried there. But Foskey's bat, we talked about it with the Rangers system. Go check out that episode for those listening that have more interest in the Rangers prospects. Like, he really eliminated the swing and miss concern. And, and to me, he's he's an above average hit tool guy with the power. Like, the, he's going to be he's going to be an above average big league hitter. We'll see how the rest of everything kind of shakes out. But he's safe and he's good and he's solid and um. It's easy to forget, you know, how how solid he was last year with all these names that, you know, have kind of just jumped over him because of a little bit more dynamic ability and, and a little bit more consistent performance besides just last year. But I, I agree. I think Foskey's kind of lost in the shuffle here, which is unfair because he, he had a really nice season last year. 100%. Okay, this is a tough one. I don't want to be a homer, but this is another clue into what people can expect, I think, for the 2023 top 100 list right here. And I'm going to have to do it. I'm going to have to do it. I'm going to go with pick number 27 here, which was previously Aaron Sabato, which he will not be selected in the next handful of picks. Yeah. Aaron Sabato was selected by the Minnesota twins. First baseman just, just has not hit uh, the way that he's supposed to. And that's what he was drafted to do was, was, was hit. Um, I'm going to go with Dax Fulton here. And Left-handed pitching prospect with the Miami Marlins. Dax Fulton is 6'6". Some measurements have him at 6'7". 225 pounds. Coming off of Tommy John surgery. And, you know, we got to see a little bit of him in 2021 where he, he fought some command issues. And then we got to see him fully back in 2022, Jack. This guy was dominant. A 6'6", 6'7", lefty with a good fastball plus curveball and showed something with the changeup as well. He made the jump from high A to double and absolutely shoved in his three double A starts. And then you won't see it in the fan graph stats, but shoved in a postseason start where he struck out 10. Fastball shape needs to improve a bit, but he's still able to get whiffs on it based on deception as a 6'6 guy that releases from a tough arm slot. It's kind of slingshotty, so it jumps on you pretty quickly. The curveball was just unhittable for guys last year, a 181 batting average against 45% K rate. And again, highlighting the changeup, that pitch made some strides last year. It, he would leave it elevated at times, but overall, I thought it improved a lot. If I'm getting a 6-6 lefty who just absolutely shoved last year, relatively speaking, yes, it was a 380 RA, but he struck out 150 in 118 innings as a high school big lefty. 
42 walks is, is a big improvement in those 118 and a thirds innings. I'm thrilled to get a Dax Fulton here, and he's going to be on our top 100 list in the 2023 update. For the love of God, Miami, trade some starting pitch. In depth. <laughs> I mean, they have so much. You talk yeah. about the big league level. Sandy's not moving, but then you got Pablo, you've got Lazardo, you've got Edward Cabrera, you've got Trevor Rogers, and then down below, Max Myers working his way back from Tommy John surgery. Dax Fulton, you mentioned, is a top 100 guy. Jake Eater is a borderline top 100 guy. Yuri Perez might be the best pitching prospect in the game. Like, there are so, so many options here. Just move some of them, please. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't want Dax Fulton to be one of them. I'd rather, I think I'd rather move Jake Eater uh, at this point. And Eater's a name that probably just going to miss the cut. Uh, and, you know, he was phenomenal in 2021 going straight to double A. But Fulton's upside is just it's just immense. Yeah. Um, all right. You mentioned the size. I'm going to go with the guy that's 6'6", 230 at 28, right? This is pick number 28. Yeah. yeah. Pick number 28 was originally Austin Wells with the New York Yankees. Austin Wells, I think he, I like, fine. Like it would be okay if I stuck with the pick. Yeah, but I, I wouldn't blink if he stuck with him. I think Austin Wells, his most viral moment has been pimping a double and getting thrown out at second, right? Pimping a single and he got gunned down at second was base. Was that Wells? I thought that was Seagor. Oh, that might've been Anthony Siegler. Yeah, it, no, just don't, don't, don't put that, that, don't put that on Austin Wells. Yeah, sorry. Just another generic Yankee catching prospect. Yeah, um, Wells much better. Wells much better than Anthony Siegler, but yeah, Siegler was the one that pimped the crap out of a single that turned into a single in a eight, six put out. Uh, all right. 28. I, I'm going with the guy that went 11th to the white Sox. I got to go with Garrett crochet here and you're smiling. Crochet averaged 99.8 miles an hour on his fastball in 2020. And, and he did not throw a game. He did not throw an inning in minor league baseball. So he gets up in 2020 he gets, I think, six innings at the end of the regular season and in the postseason. But, I mean, it was a 100-mile-an-hour fastball, and he was, like, only throwing that. He threw it 88% of the time in those six innings. In 2021, he was actually given an opportunity to be a setup guy, and he was a great setup guy. 54 and a third innings, 2.82 ERA. He sat, like, 97 with his fastball, and everybody was saying, what the hell's wrong with Garrett Crochet? I thought he was sitting 101. He is. Obviously, he gets shut down. Tommy John surgery ahead of this year. The slider was elite, though. An 85-mile-an-hour slider that opponents hit 140 against. This guy, even if the ship has sailed on him being a starting pitcher, and I think it has, he is 100 from the left side with a wipeout slider. He's got closer stuff. And if I can take a closer 28th overall, I'm going to do it. Yep. Hey, I, I'm I'm totally fine with it at this range. I was curious when you would take him, but at this range to get a guaranteed big league arm who's going to contribute to you, <laughs> you know, to your big league squad, it, it's it's a, it's a no brainer there, I think. And um, I was ready to take him probably with like my last pick, but I knew I wouldn't I wouldn't have the opportunity to. So yeah. I mean, you're getting you're getting a guy that plugs right into your bullpen and and is one of your more high leverage arms from the jump. So I'm I'm, I'm with that. We go to pick 29, which Your last was one. previously Bobby Miller of the Los Angeles Dodgers. And I'm going to go with, with and I, I have to take this guy. I really do. And uh, it, I, I know you're you're wondering who it's going to be because I think there's two names that you're, you're juggling between in your head here. But I, I got to go with the guy that I am higher on than everybody else in the entire industry. So I, I can't leave him off of the first round of a of a redraft owen casey and this was previously bobby miller i'm going owen casey 20 years old chicago cubs outfielder he's 6'4 200 pounds really had a nice season all things considered last year in high a and i always talk about how people have kevin alcantara in the cub system ranked ahead of casey and they're both monster dudes alcantara is 6'6 and a little bit more athletic but casey 6'4 hits the ball harder and alcantara put up similar numbers in low A. Casey put up these numbers in high A, 113 WRC plus. He struck out 28% of the time, but it's a 19-year-old in high A. I'm fine with that. 11 home runs, walked at a 12% clip. We saw him hit the ball 114 miles per hour as a max exit velo last year, dude. He's got more room to add power. He's got some things to smooth out with his swing a little bit more. 114 max exit velo is insane. 
for a 19 year old. And I think he's going to be a guy that could grow into 70 grade power. So 70 grade power, left-handed swing, better bat to ball skills. And I think he gets credit for, and he talked to us about this, uh, you know, and during the Arizona fall league, he said on, on the podcast that he wanted to add some more speed and athleticism. If he adds a little bit more of that too, he did swipe 11 bags, but if he can add a little bit more of that too, better defender in the corner, this is 30 home run upside, a pretty good feel to hit left-handed stick big projection in the frame. I, I think Casey could end up being uh, one of the, the better power bats of this whole class, which is crazy to say, but he's, he's got that kind of talent. I think Cubs fans know what they have with Owen Casey, even at the lower levels. And and we've talked about it time and time again, right? Like Cubs fans are as in tune with what's happening at the minor league level than a, as any other fan base in professional baseball. Um, I think they know that Casey has the chance to have that prodigious power. And Casey factors into their long-term plan. So I love that pick. I was thinking you were going to go with him or the other Casey. No other Casey. It really hurts me to not take Casey Schmidt, who would be my very next pick. Yeah, um, I get it. Mine's not going to be Casey Schmidt, actually. Criminal. So Casey Schmidt, I know, I'm sorry. Um, and you're going to hate that I go with this guy. And I know that I'm going to check the box here, but like I have to because I think that he's got so many pitches that are good. He's got a fastball that's probably in the 55 to 60 grade range. He's got a curveball, a slider, and a changeup that are probably in the 55 to 60 grade range. Yes, he struggled a little bit. He was just under a four ERA this past year in double, but I I have to do it. The original pick at 30, we're, we're adding another pick because Houston had their pick forfeited. So this pick was the first pick of the competitive balance round, and that was Westberg, who already went. Um I'm going with Emerson Hancock, who originally went four or six to Seattle. Hancock, like my ship is not sailed on Emerson Hancock yet. That's fair. That's fair. I hear you. Now, could I go with the gold glove third baseman? Yes, but my ship is not sailed on Emerson Hancock yet. Yeah, this is a this is a falling on the sword moment here, I think. Um, yeah, it is. Fastball played well. Uh, did, just really struggled with the secondary stuff, uh, but he's still Emerson Hancock and he's 6'4", 215 and can have that power stuff and, and, and the bully ball, like you always say. So like you could bounce back next year and you'll be laughing at me and saying, look, how'd you let me get this guy 30th overall? Right. So I, I don't have anything against the pick, but this was the number one guy that I had for you taking ahead of me. Yeah. Um, So yeah. let's, let's wrap up with that real quick uh, as we end this episode here. Who did you have? Who were the eight names that you had me taking before you? Um, all right. So the names that I did not get, I hit on four of them. Um, I had you picking Mervis, and I ended up picking Mervis. I had you picking Evan Carter, and I went with Carter earlier than I think you were expecting me to. Um, I had you taking Jake Eater. That right. could have been interchangeable with Dax Fulton, it but was, yeah. yeah, Eater slash Fulton, I, I thought you were going to take. So I'm going to give myself half a point. I got four and a half. Um, Casey Schmidt, I thought you were going to take Casey Schmidt. You did not, but I got you on Pete Crow Armstrong, Tyler Soderstrom, who I knew you've been on a big kick with, Owen Casey, and Alec Burleson. It's pretty solid. Okay. So I had you taking Kyle Harrison. Yeah. Reed Detmers. I, I took him. Torque. Yeah. Hassel, I took him. V, yeah. yeah. Correct. Romo, correct. Correct. Hancock, correct. Abel, off. I took him. And Mervis. I actually had you taking Mervis. So I think I had one more than you. Yeah, I think so. I think it was that was pretty good. That was pretty good. We were both on it. Um, that'll do it for this 2020 redraft. Uh, do you, should we go through the picks real quick one last time? Yeah, um, just one through 30. Spencer Strider, one. Jordan Walker, two. Pete Crow Armstrong, three. Kyle Harrison, four. Reed Detmers, five. Spencer Torkelson, six. Bobby Miller, seven. Evan Carter, eight. Brandon Fott, pitcher in the Diamondback system, nine. Gavin Stone with the Dodgers, 10. Mason Wynn, 11. Zach Veen, 12. Robert Hassel, the third, 13th. Cade Cavalli, 14th. Tyler Schoderstrom, 15th, Jordan Westberg in the O system, 16, Mick Abel, 17, Matt Mervis, 18, Max Meyer, 19, Jared Schuster in the Braves system, 20, Alec Burleson, 21, Drew Romo in the Rocky system, 22, low A extraordinaire Tink Hentz, 23, Wilmer Flores, the other Wilmer Flores, who is related to Wilmer Flores in the Tigers system, 24, Joey Weimer with the Brewers, 25, 
Justin Foskey with the Rangers, 26. Miami's Dax Fulton, 27. Garrett Crochet, 28. Owen Casey with the Cubs, 29. And Emerson Hancock, 30. How about that? I love it. I love it. Can't wait for people to rip that apart on social media and in our YouTube comments and everything. But hope you enjoyed this episode. We will be doing more redrafts as we continue to go through this offseason. Keep an eye out for Pirates Top Prospects as well. And we'll probably redraft the redraft in a few months once everything of course fluidly changes uh, with a lot of these players as we move forward into the season but this was a lot of fun please be sure to subscribe to the youtube uh, leave us a rating on the podcast and we look forward to talking pirates prospects with you later this week